Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. And uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the launch of our FAO eLearning Academy guide on uh, methodologies and good practices. Uh, I, I have to say that this guide really uh, documents over the almost 20 years of, of experience where we're trying through this guide to, to share experience, to share our le lessons learned, to, to share with you some tips uh, about. But um, uh, I just also wanted to mention that this event is an event organized with also with our sister agency, UN, um, the United Nations, uh, UN ESCAP, with the Future Food Institute, with Agrinium. So uh, we are uh, four, organi uh, four organizations organizing the, this event. We are extremely pleased to have uh, here with us uh, the FL uh, Deputy Director for Partnerships and uh, the Outreach Stream. Uh, Beth Bechtel, uh, who is here to, to say a few words about the, the, the role and the importance of the FAO eLearning Academy. So, Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Sure. Thank you, Christina, and thanks to everybody for being a part of this. I'm really pleased to be able to be here with you and to open this event and welcome everyone to the official launch of FAO's Guide on E-Learning Methodologies and Good Practices. As Christina mentioned, today we are joined by experts from the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization and also FAO's own regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean. I would like to just share a few thoughts uh, with you on the role of the guide and on the contribution that I think it will bring to our ongoing transformation towards global digital inclusion and learning. First, I would say that this publication could not have come at a better time. COVID-19 related restrictions have provided an unexpected springboard for more virtual learning tools and solutions. There's been a big increase in demand for e-learning with a move towards content that works on a range of devices, including our smartphones. And the pandemic has also demonstrated the importance of having e-learning that is tailored to country specific needs. And the guide provides clear methodologies and quality criteria to facilitate this. Certification of competencies gained is what the new generation of online learners are looking for as they build their own competencies from a broad array of online offerings. And so the FAO eLearning Academy uniquely offers digital badges for several of our courses, providing a boost to an individual's career progression and a further incentive for learners to complete any given course. Secondly, I would share that the guide supports countries and institutions that need to adopt new methodologies to provide these kinds of quality learning experiences. Creating e-learning courses is easier than ever, and we are seeing many more rolling out in our member countries. Now, it is important, though, to ensure that the quality and effectiveness of technology-based learning solutions is a priority. And this can only be achieved by analyzing learning needs and applying sound methodologies in the design of e-learning. Based on 15 years now of delivering e-learning solutions for FAO members, this guide provides instructional design principles, methods, guidelines, tips, examples, and case studies that are particularly relevant for organizations working in the development context. And finally, I would just like to reiterate the importance of adopting innovative and mobile responsive learning solutions. A lot has changed since the first version of this guide was published 10 years ago. This edition covers new topics such as micro learning and mobile learning. These formats are particularly suitable for those with limited time for learning, but with a constant need to acquire new information and to apply new knowledge and new skills. Mobile learning now gives access to learning content with our handheld devices, our smartphones, and our tablets. It is estimated that 4 billion people use their phones to improve their own education or that of their children. This represents 140 million users more than in 2017 and clearly is a part of a growing trend in learning. Interest in 
anytime and anywhere learning via mobile devices is also growing rapidly in developing countries. It is cost effective and it is available on more affordable devices and networks. And micro learning is another learning trend which provides short form content to provide learners with just-in-time information that can be acquired in less than 10 minutes. Microlearning's characteristics of brevity and design for just-in-time learning make it particularly suited to delivery on our mobile devices. So I strongly encourage you all to consult this guide and to learn about these new and exciting trends in digital learning. It gives me great pleasure to officially launch the guide today here with you, which is available in English and soon to be available in French and Spanish. I look forward now to the presentation of the guide and hearing the testimonials about just how important its contributions are. And on that note, I'd like to now give the floor to Ms. Marcella Villarreal, Director of FAO's Partnerships and UN Collaboration Division. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you. I would like to join in the very warm welcome uh, to everybody to this official launch of the FAO eLearning Academy Guide on eLearning Methodologies and Good Practices. Let me start with a quote from Nelson Mandela, a person who I've always admired very much. And he says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And I couldn't agree more with that. Education, capacity development are the keys to eliminating gender inequality, to reducing poverty, to creating a sustainable planet, to preventing needless deaths, and illness and fostering peace and many more. And in a knowledge economy, education is the new currency by which nations maintain economic competitiveness and global prosperity. Education is an investment and one of the most critical investments we can ever make. This is true for countries around the world, not only South, North and South. And for us at FAO, capacity development is, of course, a core function. It is the essence of the work that we do at country level. This is what we leave behind when we are addressing very difficult development problems as we do in our day-to-day -day life. In order to achieve the SDG Agenda 2030, we need competent professionals who are able and capable of taking appropriate decisions formulating targeted and sustainable policies and strategies and adopting an innovative green methodologies, if you want to call them this way, and technologies. We cannot achieve sustainable, sustainability without the development of capacities, knowledge, skills, and competences. And that is exactly the overall objective of our FAO eLearning Academy. In addition to cutting edge content, good practices and new methodologies developed by FAO in collaboration with very many partners worldwide, innovative pedagogical models, learning approaches and strategies are also needed for the development of competencies and transformation needed towards sustainability. The FAO e-learning guide documents over 15 years of experience of FAO e-learning pedagogical models and learning solutions. As the director of the division that hosts the uh, e-learning academy, and very proudly so, I am proud to mention that the first edition of the guide was among the 10 most visited publications of FAO in the recent years, and also benefits numerous institutions worldwide in their efforts towards the adoption of e-learning at corporate level. We're extremely pleased to launch this valuable publication today, and we look forward to the de detailed presentation of the methodologies and learning solutions it offers. So it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Andrew Nadeau. Over to you, Andrew. Great, thank you very much, Marcella. Appreciate that. Thank you, Beth, for launching the guide. Um, while Beth provided some ideas of what to look for in the new guide, I'm here to provide a bit of historic perspective. 
That's what happens if you're the one with gray hair in the room. This guide follows in the footsteps of the original, which was published in 2011. The idea of such a guide had been on the minds of the e-learning team for some time, as we often ask how we produced our courses. A lot of our members and a lot of our partner institutions ask, how can we do this? How do we set up a similar system? How do we go about getting out to our learners and our, our constituents? However, time and resources were always a constraint. We weren't able to do so. But fortunately, in 2010, we had the good fortune of obtaining funding from Germany to work on a two-year blended learning program with three regional organizations. These were ASEAN, Sils Agrimet, and Comesa. And we worked with them to jointly deliver learning programs specific to food security professionals in their respective member states. The learning programs are based on part of an extensive suite of e-learning courses that we had produced with generous funding from the EU. Part of the program, we were actually supposed to support our regional partners in developing their own e-learning systems and platform. So suddenly, funding was available to produce a guide on how to develop e-learning courses FAO style. We quickly decided this was the opportunity to create a first edition of the guide and to deliver it as a global public good. We were fortunate enough to have EU funding available to produce the French, Spanish versions of the guide shortly afterwards. Now, finally, when we have we have a full answer when we ask, how can we create our own courses? We point people to the guide, and so far, it's been proven a great success. Marcella mentioned the numbers. Since, 10, 000, uh, since 2011, the guide has been in and around the top 10 downloads of FAO, top, 15, uh, top 10 last year, top 15 in 2009, and even in the top five of 2018. This is a good indicator of how popular and in demand the guide, the guide is, and I think the latest version will boost these numbers immensely. Don't forget, those of you familiar with FAO, you realize that this guide is in competition with publications such as the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, one of our FAO flagship publications. So well done, I say. Now's the time to take uh, me to take time to recognize the primary author of the guide, Beatrice Gertini, good friend as well. First met Beatrice when she was working from an external firm that we hired to get us started on e-learning. One of the examples she showed us was a course she developed on how to sell a certain model of Fiat in Ireland. Now, I'm not one to comment on the need for such a course, having no knowledge of the appetite for fiats by the Irish public. But one thing that struck me about how well the course was designed and how it con concisely explained how to get the task done. Of course, we did hire Beatrice to work with us, as well as many other instructional designers and courseware developers that make up today's team. And what you'll find in the multiple multitude of offerings through the FAO eLearning e Academy of, are very practical courses designed for working professionals and upcoming young professionals in the, feed and food, in the field of food and agriculture. These courses are designed to ensure the correct knowledge and skills are imparted to on-the-job professionals. That's the key behind all of this. Now, does it work? Well, over the years, we conducted learner surveys, and we have results that show that 90% plus of our users acquired new knowledge and skills. And even more telling is that the same percentage of users are telling us that they apply these newly acquired skills in the workplace, on the job. Now, a lot of work and planning goes into creation of these courses. I think this is clear. Those of you who are familiar with the guide realizes how complex uh, an operation it might be. I am not going to go into details as Beatrice will be providing an overview of the guide, but I can say that the new version is fantastic in my very biased opinion. I would like to congratulate Beatrice the FAO eLearning Academy team, and the other contributors to the guide. I would also be remiss if I don't thank the Global Network Against Food Crisis Partnership Program, which is funded by the EU and for which Beatrice is currently working. The program has allowed Beatrice the time and resources to produce the current guide. Again, congratulations to all involved, and I hand the floor to Christina. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And uh, before giving the floor to Beatrice, who will be um, explaining a little bit the contents and the, the, the various methodologies uh, of our guide, I just wanted for those of you who don't know us, just very, very briefly to explain what is our intention behind the FAO Learning Academy. As both Marcella and Beth were mentioning, they mentioned a lot of the world com competences. And this is exactly what we are trying to do. We are trying to transfer multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary competences, which are the ones that are needed to face the, the global challenges we are all facing. So what we are trying to do is to uh, basically offer free of charge uh, e-learning courses multilingual e-learning courses to allow anyone 
anywhere in the world to have access to, to these resources. Really, we are supporting universal education. Education should no longer be um, a, a privilege of, of just a few. So it is really a global, global public good, and it is really the result of a collaborative effort. We have worked with over 200 partners to make this a reality. We are fully aligned with the SDGs, uh, and I think that our model also uh, fu fully um, is fully aligned also with SDG 17 on collaboration. So um, we have reached so far about 700,000 learners, and we cover a number of various thematic areas, um, climate change, sustainable food systems, nutrition, but also responsible investments. What does it mean to be responsible? Uh, sustainable fisheries, sustainable forestry. How do you restore soils? Um, also, uh, how do you maintain your forestry genetic resources? So all of these thematic areas are covered and we invite you all to, to have a look. Uh, just as I was mentioning, um, we work with a number of partners. We also work with a number of universities. Um, we create um, master's and postgraduate degrees uh, where the universities integrate our courses. We share these courses with, uh, the, these, uh, with various partners for their capacity development activities. We also work a lot with UN uh, initiatives. We contribute to these initiatives and, and networks and we share everything, all the courses uh, with them too. What uh, I also wanted to mention is the importance of diversifying our, um, our pedagogical models, our delivery solutions. And this is also going to be covered by the Atriche uh, and it is covered in the guide. So um, just to tell you that we really try to diversify the models that we use also because each of us have, has a preferred way of learning. And by diversifying, you uh, certainly have a greater uh, impact. So we, we, um, we organize blended learning programs, uh, uh, online technical webinars, also mobile uh, responsive courses and, and learning programs, um, MOOCs. So, um, and Beatrice will be covering all these aspects. And, and we also put a, a, a lot of attention in innovation, um, in innovation in the design, in the content, and in the pedagogical models. I'm not going to go too much into this, but we really try to be as collaborative as possible in all the different activities that we do and in the various fa phases of the processes, because we really believe that uh, adopting a multi-stakeholder approach is surely um, a, a much richer process that uh, allows to also obtain richer products, so that generates a, a richer products. And it is also very important to work with the target audiences to make sure that everything is aligned with the professional profiles and with the competences that, that these professional profiles uh, comprise. So I'm not going to go uh, too much into the details because all of this is covered in, in, the, in the guide that Beatrice will be uh, mentioning. I just wanted to conclude by uh, saying that um, it is also crucial, especially uh, um, also with, the, with the, the pandemic, to offer the possibility to certify competences and to have an accreditation which um, which becomes a driver for uh, educational reform. It's, uh, so we use the digital badge uh, certification system, which is equitable, inclusive, transparent. And so we have been using it since uh, 2020. So this also will be covered with Beatrice, but I just wanted to mention that this is a way to certify specific competences that people have acquired, and you can personalize your pool of competences uh, by selecting them actually. So it's very, it's visible, transparent, shareable, stackable, verifiable, uh, and this is the system we are using. I just wanted to mention also that we have a number of publications and that also the, including the guide and that all of these are uh, available for free through the FAL eLearning Academy. And without further ado, I'd like to now give the floor to Beatrice Gerardini, who is the main author of the guide. Uh, however, this is also the, the work of the collaborative effort of the entire e-learning team that I'd like to acknowledge also. So Beatrice, the floor is yours. We really look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Christina, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to present the guide. I'm very happy and pleased to be here. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Okay, can you see the, my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, uh, as it was uh, already mentioned, um, the main objective of, the, of this guide is uh, to share uh, good practices and methodologies um, with everybody because, the, 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 as Christina was saying, the, the guide is, um, is a pub public good um, and uh, it addresses um, both uh, capacity development uh, managers and also instructional designer and learning designers who want to uh, develop specific uh, uh, skills on uh, um, creating e-learning e content, uh, but also uh, all those that are interested in, uh, in knowing about uh, uh, how to uh, uh, set up uh, an e-learning uh, course and a learning program. Uh, the content uh, is uh, based on uh, uh, consolidated theories and models uh, from instructional uh, researchers and on the experience uh, of uh, uh, the FAO Learning Academy that for more than 15 years has applied uh, all these uh, methodologies to the development context. Uh, as it was already said, this is a second edition uh, where uh, more uh, topics uh, were added, uh, some uh, topics were expanded, and uh, all the examples and case studies uh, well, were replaced by, by more recent uh, experiences. Um, the guide is organized into four uh, sections. Uh, the first one is an introduction providing basic concepts, while uh, uh, the other three sections um, provide concrete uh, guidance on the different phases of, uh, of an e-learning project. So we will go uh, briefly through uh, these, uh, these parts. So part one uh, um, is uh, about uh, the um, pre presents the benefits of e learning, the different types of uh, solutions that can be delivered, and also the uh, resources that are needed. So, the, uh, what kind of activities and uh, uh, professional roles are involved in uh, developing an e learning program? Talking about uh, solutions, uh, uh, there are uh, different types of content that can be used for self-paced e-learning, but uh, can also be uh, associated to social interaction uh, tools. Uh, so, for example, we can have the simple resources uh, like uh, videos or documents, uh, but also more comprehensive e-learning courses, uh, um, tests, uh, uh, simulations, job aids. Uh, these are all types of e-learning content. Um, and they can be used in online facilitated courses, uh, webinars, or massive open online courses uh, to uh, allow uh, learners to uh, interact with other participants, with uh, instructors, uh, with facilitators. So adding the social components to the learning. Um, also, there is uh, in this first part an overview of uh, blended learning which is an approach combining face-to-face uh, -face and online learning. Uh, since 2011, uh, the FAO Learning Academy has uh, uh, delivered a series of uh, blended learning programs at both uh, national and regional level um, to uh, enhance capacity of professionals to implement uh, core programs in their own countries. And, all these programs follow, apply uh, a common uh, model that uh, FAO uh, is using, as adopted, and which is described in the guide. And you will also find a case study um, that shows the, the different uh, aspects of one of these programs, including the impact that the program had on the country. 
And another highlight is on uh, mobile learning, as was already mentioned uh, before. It's a, uh, it's a way of uh, providing learning uh, through uh, mobile devices like smartphones and uh, tablets. And it's a way to, uh, to join, uh, for example, learners who are in uh, remote areas and have uh, limited connectivity and also a way to provide just-in-time uh, content for those who need uh, uh, to uh, rapidly access information and content. And in the guide, there is in, the first part, in this first part, there is an example on, uh, of a um, mobile responsive resource for uh, private investors on uh, uh, investing responsibly uh, in agriculture. Um, and which consists of uh, small uh, elements. Uh, so there is an introductory video, uh, there is a self-assessment tool and a series of short uh, lessons that are uh, quite suited for uh, mobile learning. The second part is uh, on the first stages of an e-learning program and the analysis and design. And these are uh, crucial uh, steps. Uh, for any kind of learning project, uh, whether it is an e-learning or self-paced learning, a blended or a facilitated course. I just would like to highlight one uh, method that we use, uh, that is, uh, it, we use to ensure that the learning is relevant for learners, that they um, can use it in their job as well. And the, this method is the task analysis, which is a way to uh, identify the content of a course uh, looking at the job tasks that the learners should learn or improve. So starting from this perspective, we identify the content that should be included in the, in the course. And you will find an example on the series of uh, uh, e-learning courses on SDG indicators. Uh, for which we um, applied this uh, uh, analysis at the beginning to have uh, at the end uh, a um, harmonized series of, uh, of courses uh, which are organized in a similar way. Um, and also the definition of delivery methods, instructional methods and evaluation methods is, is important and uh, should take into account uh, not only the content and not only the, also the um, technological uh, issues and constraints, but also learners related factors like uh, uh, their familiarity with the uh, technologies, their familiarity with digital communication, uh, and also their uh, previous knowledge and skills, uh, the, the, um, also the, uh, the time that they have, have available for uh, learners and uh, other elements. And these elements can drive then the choice of, for example, um, the delivery format, if uh, it's a mobile learning course or an e-learning course, and also the, if we are using asynchronous uh, communication methods, uh, so happening at different times, or if we are using synchronous uh, methods like uh, video conferences, for example. Sorry. Then, as Christina uh, was explaining, um, related to uh, evaluation, there is also the certification of competencies acquired through the courses. Um, this is um, uh, this is very important because uh, digital badges uh, provide an opportunity uh, for learners to, uh, to share, to show their accomplishments and for employers to have a granular view of uh, uh, the learner's skills and, and knowledge and competencies. Um, digital badges, also called, uh, called micro-credentials or digital credentials, are uh, visual representations of uh, uh, the skills and competencies acquired by doing a specific learning activity. Um, they have these three main features. They are, uh, they are stackable so that uh, you can uh, show a collection of uh, knowledge, skills, competencies coming from different sources, coming from both formal and uh, informal uh, learning activities. Uh, they are shareable, so they can be displayed in uh, uh, professional and social networking platforms like 
Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. They can also be embedded into web pages and in um, digital signatures in emails. And they are also verifiable uh, because uh, uh, they embed metadata that uh, describe the, um, a series of uh, elements like the, um, the uh, issuing organization, the kind of activity that they correspond to, uh, the criteria that uh, have been used to assign that badge. Um, then the third part is, uh, uh, is really uh, providing concrete guidance to uh, create the learning content from the, from the, the stage in which uh, the designer worked with, his, uh, with the sub subject matter expert uh, to the creation of the storyboard, uh, to the use of different uh, um, instructional techniques uh, that facilitate learning. Uh, so the, here the objective is to make learning uh, clear and engaging uh, for learners. So uh, there are a number of uh, techniques to use, including the use of examples to clarify the content, uh, the use of tests uh, to um, reinforce the messages, the use of media, and it's very important to use uh, uh, a right mix of media without uh, overloading the, the working memory of learners, and, but uh, um, uh, paying attention to, uh, to choose media that are functional to the uh, learning process. And then a series of techniques that can be used according to the type of content, like uh, the use of pedagogical agents, uh, which gives some uh, human sense to the lessons, and other methods that are more uh, related to uh, the development of uh, job-related skills, like storytelling, case-based scenarios. Um, that I will provide an example later. Uh, then the gamification, which uh, adds elements that uh, uh, increase motivation and engagement uh, of learners, and micro-learning, uh, which are uh, short learning, uh, learning resources uh, that correspond to one uh, learning objective and that particularly uh, appropriate uh, for, for being delivered on uh, mobile devices. There is also a chapter on the selection of authoring tools, so providing some criteria when uh, selecting uh, an authoring tools for both e-learning and mobile uh, learning. These are uh, two examples of a scenario-based technique, uh, which uh, is very effective uh, to, uh, to teach strategic uh, skills and job-related skills um, because uh, uh, it creates, um, it, it presents a challenging situation where the learner is the main actor and the learner has to solve uh, a series of uh, problems uh, uh, by making some choices. So uh, it, uh, it's uh, uh, really useful to, um, to teach uh, uh, skills that are uh, strategic and, and uh, that, uh, where the learner has, has to use different elements, put together different elements to solve the situation. So the, the one on the left is an example of a course entirely designed around uh, a scenario. And uh, here the trigger event uh, is the, uh, a bad evaluation received on, a, on an agricultural program. So the learner has to somehow to redesign the, the program and he will, uh, they will collect information uh, from different stakeholders and make some choices on the design. Um, and the other example is a, um, is a mobile responsive uh, tool, is a, an assessment a final assessment um, of a course on uh, responsible investment. Um, and here the learner is presented with a, with a case and uh, uh, can choose an avatar. So can decide if, uh, if it's a woman or a, or a man. And, and then the information is presented uh, through a series of videos um, and the learner has to, to make, to answer some questions, uh, get um, a final score, which, uh, which allows uh, the final certification through digital uh, badging. And the last part of the, of the guide is about social interaction. Uh, so there is um, a description of how to prepare uh, uh, for uh, an online facilitated course, which is a course uh, where activities are organized into a chronological order 
um, are facilitated by experts and are delivered through an online platform. Um, so there is a description of the different uh, activities and components of these uh, courses with the, uh, examples taken from the, our experience. And also um, an overview of the different communication tools and collaboration tools that can be used uh, in, in a course. Um, and um, some tips on how to use these uh, uh, tools for e-learning. And this is also uh, completed by a, a case study of um, online training of trainers, which was uh, supposed to be a blended learning program, but then because of uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions was um, converted to a, a virtual course using both uh, live sessions and asynchronous activities. And the other one is a uh, massive open online course, uh, again, uh, mixing different types of activities and involving more than, than 5,000 uh, learners. Uh, and the last chapter of the of the guide is about is a, let's say uh, is about technology. So it's uh, about the different learning platforms that can be used to deliver uh, e-learning, with a focus, of course, on um, open source solutions like Moodle, which is the platform that, that we are using at the Fire Learning Academy and other solutions for uh, limited connectivity. So before closing, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, all uh, the colleagues who contributed to this guide. Um, so we'll start with uh, Yasmina Tizovic, who authored uh, the two chapters on uh, technology. Uh, Chiara Nicodemi, uh, who provided the uh, case studies of the blended learning program and the, and the online training of trainers program. Uh, Dalian Gusen, who authored the section on the certification through digital badges. Then Sara Ferrante, Ilka Iholt, Mariangela Pisani, Fabio Picinic, and Julia Ramadan, who provided examples and checklists on uh, uh, MOOCs and webinars. The entire uh, FAWE Learning Academy team, so uh, all my colleagues in the, in the e-learning academy team, because all the examples are taken from, from their work uh, that they daily uh, carry out. Um, all the reviewers who provided uh, comments and suggestions on, on, the, core, on the guide, uh, uh, Claire for the editing, and uh, a special thank to uh, Claudia Illuzzi, who made the graphical design that I think is very uh, effective and, and very nice. So that's all. Thank you for uh, your attention. And here I, you find again the, the links to the uh, to the PDF and also to the flip page version of, of the guides. Um, thank you so much. I hope you will uh, enjoy reading the guides. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And actually, uh, while you were presenting, I was looking at some of the questions. And uh, so uh, I would like to give some answers before giving the floor to our two, um, to our two guests. So um, some of the questions were related to, uh, so as I mentioned, for us, it's extremely important to try to think of multidisciplinary competencies. And this includes also um, soft skills and interpersonal uh, competencies, which is also the capacity, the capacity to negotiate, the capacity to, to communicate, to listen, writing skills, writing reports, uh, writing um, actionable recommendations. So these are also uh, some, some of our courses also cover the soft skills. So the, this is to answer some of the questions. Um, then some of you were asking uh, if we offer uh, free e-learning courses. This is exactly what we do. We offer free multilingual e-learning courses available to anyone. And it's very easy to access them. It's uh, e-learning.fau.org. So it's very easy. And some of you were asking about the technology. So in the guide, you have an entire chapter about the technology, 
However, if you're interested to know about what we are using, we are using the Moodle platform, which for us is very suitable for uh, low connectivity areas and also for language purposes uh, and uh, because we are multilingual. And uh, as an offering tool for the, for the courses themselves, we use uh, Storyline, uh, so Articulate uh, 360 Storyline. So um, we will be answering all your questions and documenting all your questions and responding. And the documents will be available online uh, on the FAOE Learning Academy in the webinar section and also the recording of, of this launch. So I would like now uh, to give the floor to Tom, Tom Wanbeke, who is the Chief of Learning and Innovation in our um, sister agency, uh, the um, the, it's the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization. Uh, and we are extremely pleased to have Tom uh, with us here um, because uh, they have also been part of all of this. So I would like to give the floor to Tom. Tom, go, thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot, uh, Christina and, and colleagues. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you in this kind of official introduction of the FAO e-learning guide, which I had already the opportunity to sneak in and to see what it was. And I was thinking, what can I say um, in these, let's say, the 10 minutes that have been allocated uh, to me? And I titled my input as uh, I've called it the ripple effect. That only will become clear at the end of my presentation. But um, looking at when Andrew was presenting the, the historical perspective, actually, I was looking also on my own blog, and that brought me back to 2011. And this was an article that we have published in 2011, uh, Andrew, the time that we were still young, you know. And um, I still remember very vividly uh, Andrew standing somewhere. I don't remember at what conference it was. It was with this uh, manual. You cannot see it because of my green screen, but it was equally uh, beautiful at that time and quite pioneering in, let's say, the... Um, in the UN field, uh, because these are, let's say, large uh, institutions making a very accessible uh, document for, let's say, non-e-learning experts. That was something that was not done yet. Yeah, there were plenty of e-learning animals, but they were all member of the, I would call it, uh, using all kind of technical uh, language full of uh, abbreviations and both uh, Andrew and me, we are a member of the AAAAA, which is the American Association Against the Abuse of Acronyms. So we wanted to have something very uh, accessible uh, in there. And the work of the team has been great uh, into that. Now it's actually interesting because we jumped from 2011 to 2021. So it has been already a decade. That's the second thing that is quite unusual. You know, partnerships uh, sometimes hardly survive a biennium. Here we are already working, let's say, 10 years uh, together as uh, professional colleagues, uh, also as friends after working so long time uh, together. And uh, this was a decade of uh, action. Uh, I, would, I would like to congratulate the FAO that already 15 years ago, you were preparing for this pandemic because a lot of other UN institutions got into a massive panic uh, by way of speaking when the pandemic arrived and had to go into a very rush in towards this kind of, everything was digital transformation in the last year while a very few organizations already have put the building blocks, let's say a decade or 15 years ago. For us, there was no panic. That was actually the age of acceleration and all the hesitance and resistance that there was around uh, e-learning has now become common uh, good. And I think relaunching what you have done now, the e-learning uh, manual is, is also strategic because I think we need to look towards the next decade, uh, which should be also a decade of even more intensive uh, acceleration. Because if I look to different areas, for example, the current UN reform, the views that are now being stressed on how are we going to organize learning and, and training in a world that probably will disrupt it by more disruptions than just the pandemic that we have had right now. I think we have the building blocks here. So I would like to give you three images of inspiration on how we could further partner up because as I said, when my training, when my director at the time, 11 years ago, he asked me exactly the same question. Can you not uh, design a manual for e-learning? I said, no, I'm not, not going to design it. There already exists one manual. So I'm going to use 
that manual because reinventing the wheel is also something that within the UN is a common you know, threat and actually reusing what you have been using and adding our synergies and complementarities on that was actually the beauty of this partnerships. It's basically SDG 17 translated into concrete action. And that's what we also should do more in the future. So what are my three ideas that I wanted to share uh, with you? Um, one of the things that impresses me, because if I remember 10 years ago when I looked at the first self-guided online courses that are out there, there were already quite a bunch. When I look 10 years later, there's actually tons of them. And one number st struck to me. That was like you said, we've reached out to 700,000 uh, learners. Uh, ask you know, any other agencies in terms of numbers, not many uh, agencies or capacity building partners have reached scalability. Everyone is, re is preaching scalability in terms of outreach and e-learning, but doing it also effectively requires also a solid structure and a solid uh, organization. Uh -huh. I'm also quite impressed how specifically 10 years ago, throughout with a minimum of resources, you had like a kind of a maximum impact. And this is also something that I would like to congratulate you uh, for. So what am I asking with this? Um, this has nothing to do with the uh, recent uh, putting my phone off. This has nothing to do with the uh, recent uh, launch of Richard Branson somewhere on the moon. But I think at this stage, it would be interesting to formulate some additional moonshots, what you would like to do in the next 10 years and where would you like to go? And there's plenty of ideas that actually pop into my head where we could engage in interagency collaboration on these kind of fields. Specifically, I remembered in, in the beginning, Christina and also Andrew said, yeah, it's really suited for FAO context. You know, really, this is the thematic, this is the mandate. But if you look at the SDGs, they are so interconnected, interrelated that only between ILO and FAO, I can spot many, let's say, possible synergies, specifically in the field of e-learning, but also in other areas which we have collaborated, where we also use the, the e-learning manual, whether that was now on child labor or other topics. I mean, there's a lot of cross-section points that we should elaborate further. So I'm, I'm asking how can we do that moonshot thinking? I was looking at the recent uh, report from the UN uh, Joint Inspection Unit where they were basically looking into policies and platforms in support towards more coherence, coordination and convergence, a note that was actually shared with the Secretary General. I wanted to see more of you know, these kind of standards. For me, the e-learning manual that you have developed should be a standard UN manual, just to court. This is something that is cross-sectionally can be used and to avoid the reinvention of the wheel, it could be multiplied um, much more. What else uh, would I like to uh, mention there? Well, there's a relevance and yeah, the question is here, how can we create more multipliers? We have been using the, the guide into plenty of uh, training of trainers. We have seen also that throughout the new modalities that you have experimented with in the last 10 years, we had some unique scaling options. I'm thinking about the massive online open uh, courses, which reach wide audiences. I'm thinking about the hackathons that you have been doing, the boot camps and so on. So that's definitely an area of doing more. The second uh, element, and this is also the beauty when I compare the first manual and now the revised manual, there's a kind of strong connection between them. Most of the e-learning manuals are always going to talk about the new technologies. And what happens when you talk about e-learning technologies, you launch it and one year after it's already you know, overdue because a new technology has it replaced. Your strategy has always been very much focused on, on three things, on design, design, and design. That's probably why it's also called e-learning methodologies, so that even your first manual is still relevant uh, today. And the manual that you have basically introduced right now will be relevant also a decade from now when we get together in a new webinar where uh, maybe some of us will be retired already, but at least this will be extremely relevant in 2031 uh, when we actually make to the assessment of you know what happened with the SDGs. So that's definitely what the second element, where can we invest in more innovations? Uh, what I liked about the, uh, the manual, it was not on, only on self-guided e-learning and tutor-based e-learning, you went really broad. You know, already the Deputy Director General mentioned uh, the new trends in terms of micro-learning, in terms of hybrid learning and so on. I think there we could do also more together because e-learning is not any more captured in the isolated cell of a few e-learning specialists, it's going to become a cross-section mandate of everyone who's involved into uh, capacity building. Just to mention out, 
we have now put learning innovation as a cross-cutting strategic driver in our strategic framework of our training center that also results in having more access to resources that also results that now 20 regular budget-based positions are working specifically on this topic which i also would like to uh, to mention Maybe um, a next thing, and I also would like to thank uh, FAO Christina and the team for participating last week in our Digital Inclusion Summit. And also here, the manual is very incorporating, you know, not only digital inclusion in terms of, you know, accessibility and connectivity and making sure that you don't leave anyone behind, but also opening up space. How can we be more creative to marry innovation with inclusion? And also there, many more things can be done, you know, beyond accessibility, beyond connectivity, but also making open educational uh, resources, giving access to mobile services and, and so on. And then a last point, because I need to take the time into uh, account, and that's where I here come to my ripple um, effect. I think three things that are definitely work that we need to do jointly in this field to make it even more stronger. I mean, 10 years ago, all the question was, yeah, e-learning is less qualitative than face-to-face -face, uh, learning. And that was the biggest cliche and myth that was out there. Now, after 10 years, we have enough data. I mean, I throughout the projects that I organized together with you, we had substantial data that a few actually of these e-learning projects were even more impactful than the traditional workshop factory that we usually do throughout the world. So, and I think there, we need to invest in how can we capture uh, that. And there's a full field of learning analytics, which is now widening it up. And maybe you also need to, you know, raise awareness that how we measure the impact of e-learning is not using the same tools as we do in terms of face-to-face -face, uh, learning. And that's probably the moment where we really uh, can do it. We just issued the study around it. We can share it with you also later, but this is going to show that's really where the, the ripple effect and the acceleration effect of uh, e-learning will take place. Also, not only on impact, but on quality assurance. I mean, we were both partner of the, the, U, U, the Open Uni open ECB check initiative, which made sure that our work was done at a high quality level over 67 different criteria, even more criteria that you would find in any face-to-face -face workshop out there. And this is something that probably we would need to validate again, with maybe adapted uh, quality assurance frameworks uh, also on the new realities that you are presenting in, in the manual. We are currently engaging in an ISO certification uh, on there, but there are many other ways to do it. And I see the initiative that you're taking in terms of micro credentials and other elements all very much moving into that kind of uh, direction so these were let's say the three images that i wanted to uh, to to share uh, with you uh, with lots of uh, gratitude towards our uh, partnership hoping that we can amplify multiply and that in order to generate more ripple effects not only within fao or within ILO, but also in the larger community of stakeholders that we are uh, serving. And that's uh, my contribution to the introduction of your manual. Thanks a lot to the entire team. It has been a pleasure to work together with you and hopefully we can continue that for the next decade. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. We are also extremely grateful and it would be a pleasure as usual to work with you. Um, just before giving the floor to our our, um, our colleague from, from the regional office in Chile, I just wanted to respond to another other questions which were related to the digital badge certification. Uh, and it was just to, to say that um, digital badges are uh, well being used worldwide, uh, really. I mean, it is being uh, used as a very successful method to try to match the competences of individuals to the, to the employment opportunities. So it allows to better match the competences that you're able to, to acquire with the professional profiles and with the job opportunities uh, that are out there. So um, it, it has been extremely successful because if in addition to a university certificate or to a university degree, you are also able to uh, demonstrate that you have acquired specific competences in the field, uh, and that um, you don't only know, but you know how to do. Uh, it is. It has been very successful for uh, for increasing employment opportunities and also for uh, for um, um, talents development in organizations. Uh, we have noticed specifically 
uh, related to the SDGs, you know that FAO is custodian of a number of SDG indicators um, where we help countries to collect, uh, analyze, monitor and report on specific indicators. So the, the, this is the objective of, of the courses. And then you have a test. And if you pass the test, you have the competences in that specific indicator. We noticed that this is extremely successful also in many countries. So uh, because when countries need somebody to collect, analyze specific indicators, and you have that specific comp the competence that they are looking for, uh, so it, it is really a way to, to better match. And it is also a fair and transparent evidence-based uh, accreditation system. So we, we are quite happy with, with that. So um, I would like to now give the floor to uh, uh, Karina Crespo, who is our colleague in the regional office of, um, of FAO in Chile, uh, in Santiago, uh, Chile. And I have to acknowledge really the collaboration with our colleagues in the Núcleo de Capacitación because they have really been uh, working extremely successfully with us in the language adaptations to Spanish, in the outreach, in the, uh, the same, uh, uh, yes. So they have been supporting the entire uh, capacity development effort uh, together with us. So without uh, further ado, uh, so I would like to now give the floor to uh, Karina Crespo. Karina, the floor is yours. Karina will be speaking in Spanish, but you have the, the simultaneous translation. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, permítanme que voy a compartir pantalla. A ver. Así. Ahí está. Bueno, en principio comentarles que nosotros estamos muy agradecidos de esta invitación. Para nosotros es bien importante participar de esta actividad justamente por la relevancia que tiene la colaboración entre las distintas secciones de la organización y con otras organizaciones. Eh, contarles un poquito quiénes somos, ¿no? Somos un equipo que trabaja de manera transversal en el diseño y la implementación de estrategias de capacitación en nuestra región para América Latina y el Caribe y desarrollamos propuestas que dan respuesta a las necesidades de los proyectos y los programas de nuestra región. Eh, con orgullo, eh, queremos contarles que tenemos, hem, hemos llegado a casi 140.000 técnicos y profesionales de nuestra región y, y eso muestra también un proceso que hemos ido haciendo de crecimiento a través de los años. ¿Cuáles son nuestras funciones? Bueno, como han estado comentando los colegas, a partir de la pandemia han surgido, eh, digamos, nuevas actividades, nuevas necesidades y también han crecido las funciones, responsabilidades y servicios que nosotros ofrecemos. Pero principalmente nuestra actividad tiene que ver con la capacitación técnica, ya sea a equipos internos de la FAO como externos, eh, en todo lo que tiene que ver con capacitación de temáticas FAO. Pero además... Hemos, estamos trabajando desde el año pasado identificando cuáles son las necesidades para la región y hemos eh, llegado a la conclusión de que es necesario diseñar e implementar una, una estrategia y política de desarrollo de capacidades para la región porque hay necesidades específicas y porque también es necesario eh, aunar criterios, eh, definir estándares de calidad tener un mismo horizonte sobre qué queremos en el desarrollo de capacidades para la región. Y a partir del año pasado han surgido este, otras funciones que tienen que ver con la articulación con diferentes organizaciones o con distintos espacios dentro de la misma organización y distintos equipos, como equipos de Roma, como el equipo eh, que coordina Cristina, como equipos también de África y de Asia. Y eso hace que se enriquezca mucho el intercambio, el aprendizaje y, por supuesto, los resultados de las producciones son mucho mejores. ¿Cuáles son nuestros servicios? Nosotros tenemos... Eh, bueno, a partir de la pandemia también han crecido, digamos, las propuestas de, de estrategias de capacitación, pero fundamentalmente tenemos eh, series de webinars con, con distintos ejes temáticos, cursos de autoaprendizaje que son masivos, gratuitos y abiertos. Eh, nuestros productos son mayormente en español, pero también tenemos algunos cursos en inglés y en portugués. Eh, talleres y seminarios virtuales, cursos virtuales con tutor, con un acompañamiento más uno a uno, con actividades grupales, individuales y con, con prácticas en terreno también. 
diplomados que han resultado eh, muy interesantes porque han permitido, en algunos casos, con la semipresencialidad, hacer intervenciones específicas en instituciones, por ejemplo, instituciones educativas, con prácticas, con pasantías y con experiencias muy exitosas. Y últimamente estamos trabajando en la propuesta de desarrollar programas y trayectos de capacitación que sean más sostenidos en el tiempo y que permitan un nivel más profundo de aprendizaje. ¿Con quiénes trabajamos? Nosotros trabajamos mayoritariamente con los proyectos y los programas de la FAO, tanto a nivel de nuestra región como eh, con los países, con secretarías y ministerios de los países de la región, con distintos equipos de e-learning, de oficinas nacionales o internacionales, con universidades, con centros de investigación y con fundaciones y ONG. Es bien interesante lo que está pasando con las universidades porque muchos de nuestros participantes son estudiantes de, de las universidades cuyos docentes recomiendan nuestros cursos, entonces también es interesante ver la llegada que estamos teniendo en ese sector. Eh, proponemos mostrarles este gráfico como para tener una mirada de contexto de cómo ha ido creciendo la demanda de capacitación en nuestra región y vemos que desde el 2013 al 2019 fue en un crecimiento paulatino, pero vemos que en el, del 2019 al 2020 la demanda aumentó muchísimo. Entonces eso significó que nosotros tuvimos como que repensar las estrategias, adaptarnos a las nuevas necesidades, todo en una vertiginosa velocidad pero es una oportunidad excelente para identificar las necesidades y dar respuestas. Como para dar un ejemplo, nosotros en años anteriores teníamos una estadística, un promedio de producción de cursos de 20 a 25 cursos por año. Sin embargo, el año pasado hemos llegado a 66 productos de capacitación en el año y este año incluso eso se está multiplicando. Entonces, eh, hay toda una reestructuración del equipo y de lo que vamos ofreciendo. Nosotros estamos centrados fundamentalmente en este momento en el desarrollo, en el diseño de nuestra estrategia de desarrollo de capacidades para unificar criterios en toda la región y para llegar a, a espacios más profundos de aprendizaje. Y para esto, Identificamos dos niveles de acción. Por un lado, el desarrollo de capacidades técnicas a los equipos técnicos con los que trabaja la FAO. Pueden ser equipos técnicos internos o externos de los gobiernos. Y detectamos que había mucha oferta de sensibilización. Sin embargo, no había tanta oferta de un aprendizaje más profundo que nos llevara al cambio de práctica. Entonces, esta, este tránsito de la sensibilización al cambio de prácticas no se resuelve con un solo curso, sino que hay que combinar una serie de estrategias para lograr ese aprendizaje profundo. Y en esa, en esa, en esa área, en esa propuesta, estamos trabajando más profundamente desde el año pasado. Pero además... Eh, vimos que no alcanza con capacitar a los técnicos, sino que también hay que hacer todo un trabajo a nivel de sensibilización política para que los políticos también tomen esas decisiones y, 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 y se refuerce la idea de las políticas públicas vinculadas a las temáticas que va proponiendo FAO. Entonces, queríamos compartir un ejemplo de lo que estamos haciendo de manera muy general nuestra región se organiza en tres grandes ejes temáticos a los cuales le llamamos Iniciativa Regional 1, 2 y 3. Y bajo esta Iniciativa Regional se desarrollan todos los proyectos de la región. Entonces, además, este, los proyectos se, se unen o, o tienen en común algunos temas. Entonces, lo, estos grandes ejes temáticos se subdividen en grupos de temas y hay varios proyectos que trabajan sobre eso. ¿Qué vimos? Vimos que los proyectos tenían estrategias de capacitación en su planificación, tenían recursos y demás, pero cada uno hacía su propio curso. Entonces, como los proyectos son cortos o a veces tienen pocos recursos, siempre quedábamos en la instancia de sensibilización que es lo que se hablaba antes, ¿no? de que, que eh, no es necesario estar todo el tiempo reinventando la rueda, sino que eh, queremos propiciar un espacio de conversación entre esos proyectos, porque esos proyectos no conversaban. Entonces lo que hicimos fue juntar un grupo de proyectos que tuvieran la temática en común, que quisieran hacer capacitaciones, y proponerles que con los recursos y con los objetivos que ellos se proponían, en vez de hacer 
cinco cursos de sensibilización, hiciéramos un trayecto de capacitación que pueda ser más sostenido en el tiempo y que tenga diferentes estrategias pedagógicas para el desarrollo de capacidades a nivel más profundo. Entonces, creamos este espacio de programas y trayectos de capacitación que se diseñan de manera colaborativa entre los proyectos y, y de esa manera ofrecemos un producto más profundo, más sostenido en el tiempo y que da respuesta a todos los proyectos que participan en los diferentes países. Entonces, con eso logramos ese, ese trayecto que habíamos propuesto y queremos también empezar a trabajar en evaluaciones de impacto porque todavía estamos un poquito flojitos con eso. Eh, ¿Cuáles son los logros que tuvimos en el 2020, que ha sido un año de muchísimo crecimiento y aprendizaje? Por supuesto, ha crecido mucho nuestra, la demanda hacia nuestro equipo para el asesoramiento de programas y proyectos que tuvieran que transformar sus metodologías de enseñanza presencial a modalidades virtuales. Para esto es fundamental la utilización de la guía y todos los recursos y los instrumentos que tiene la Academia de Aprendizaje Electrónico de la FAO y que Cristina constantemente está compartiendo con nosotros porque lo tomamos como un punto de referencia, como es como nuestro punto de partida y de ahí nosotros adaptamos a la región. Eh, enriquecimos mucho el modelo pedagógico, también hemos trabajado, empezamos a trabajar con microlearning, con aprendizaje interactivo, con materiales interactivos y toda la nueva, digamos, eh, metodología pedagógica que requieren la, las nuevas épocas. ¿no? Eh, mejoramos la infraestructura tecnológica porque hemos migrado de plataforma, también eso es algo que le debemos a Cristina porque ella nos... nos acompañó en ese proceso, eh, crecimos en visibilidad interna y externa por la cantidad de demanda y, y el ofrecimiento de, del asesoramiento que hacemos, mejoramos la gestión y la sistematización de nuestros procesos porque al trabajar de manera virtual, 100% virtual, eh, eso nos, nos impulsó a gestionar mejor todo nuestro ciclo de producción, la organización de nuestra información, sistematizarlo y demás, y también nacieron nuevas líneas de trabajo articulaciones y productos. En cuanto a qué nos proponemos, qué nos queda por hacer, cuáles son nuestros desafíos, eh, estamos muy centrados en el diseño y la implementación de esta política que les comentaba que sea regional y que tengamos una mirada común en cuanto a desarrollo de capacidades. En este caso también es fundamental el apoyo y la articulación con la Academia de Aprendizaje Electrónico de la FAO esta guía y todos los otros recursos que siempre nos ofrece Cristina, el diseño y la implementación de programas de capacitación y sobre todo comenzar a pensar en evaluaciones de impacto, porque tenemos muy bien medido la cantidad de personas que, han, que, que se han inscrito, que han aprobado, que han certificado, pero no tenemos mucho tiempo mucha evaluación de qué aprenden a hacer y si lo aplican en terreno, si han cambiado la, las prácticas profesionales. Eh, sistematización de materiales educativos, hemos detectado que hay muchos cursos, muchos materiales, muchos módulos, sin embargo, no están sistematizados y tampoco están eh, difundidos. Entonces, creo que ahí el trabajo colaborativo va a ser súper importante, hay que organizar toda esa información y compartirla. Y también, eh, algo que, que nos parece muy valioso y muy importante en este tiempo es maximizar la utilización de los esfuerzos y los recursos. Esto que les decía, ¿no? que cada proyecto piensa en su propia producción y no conversa con los otros. Sin embargo, si abrimos ese espacio de colaboración, todos podemos concentrar la utilización de los recursos y estamos haciendo mucho más efectivo el trabajo, mucho más efectiva la utilización de recursos económicos y, y recursos humanos, y eso se ve reflejado en, en una mejoría para la cooperación sur-sur. Así que bueno, eso eh, eh, en una línea así como breve, y muchísimas gracias, la verdad que es un placer eh, estar compartiendo este espacio con ustedes, y, y creo que no va a ser el primero. Que van a venir más. Así que muchísimas gracias. gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Karina. Uh, thank you all very much of our um, our guide. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with all of you. I would like to thank again uh, our deputy director, our, the director of our division, also Andrew Nado, Beatrice Girardini. Fabio Picciric for the organizations, our guests, uh, Tom Wembeke and Karina Crespo, uh, and behind the scenes, also the translators that have been with us and, and the, the technical staff. And I would like to thank you all 
the participants for being with us. Thank you so much and come visit the FAO Learning Academy. Thank you. Bye-bye.